We're doing very well, Zach. I appreciate it. So everyone, Zach and I have have been having a discussion. Do y'all know about lo-fi music? Kind of that background (laughs) music you hear, kind of low reverberation. So we're very interested what exactly is it about this historic moment that makes that kind of music emerge? And so we were talking about lo-fi music, which you see is very popular as sort of like, what is it that's kind of participatory? Why is it in this moment of meta-modernism that it may have arisen and what's going on? And I find it interesting because I'm, you know, every now and then, it's kind of like interesting, I have kind of a cultural analysis, like on the kind of stories that are coming out, on the kind of music that's being played. And what does that say with the kind of cultural architecture uh, that's going on if I'm honoring Miss Wildman's work? And what does that say? And, and Zach, so I'm going to put, you know, I'm going to let uh, put High Root on the spot, was talking about like, what would it look like to have meta modern music today? Uh, what, what are the facets of that, kind of the participatory elements and things? So it's a topic that we've been interested in. Uh, that we have been discussing, and uh, and and so I've I've been very eager to talk with people about lo-fi music, like why it exists, uh, this kind of background music that's so popular, why it has arisen today. Uh, but it, it's fascinating to me. Yeah, it's fascinating to me too. And like, it wasn't the first thing that I thought of when we started talking about meta modern music and uh, art in general. But I, like, I definitely think you're right that it fits into that that notion. Um, and so maybe, like, maybe to help frame this, it would be good just if I sort of, like, talked about how I see the musical project going forward into the future and in terms of, like, its history from the past. Um, like, the, I've been th- I started thinking about it in terms of the concert. Um, and, like, the modern concert, as I see it, is based on the rock concert. Um, that was sort of the first uh musical genre that really embraced the kind of amplified sound and the flashing lights and the sort of high energy crowd um and if you trace rock music all the way back to its roots you get african rhythm and european harmony right and if you think about the way that that, that music was performed in those two cultures um it's very they're very much opposite each other in my mind like you have the the African sort of tribal dance, which is very immersive, very participative, very sort of loose. Um, And then you have the European symphony, which is very much um, sort of rigid and precise. And the the relationship between the performers and the audience is very different in those two contexts, right? In the tribal ceremony, there's there's no clear distinction between the participants and the the audience. Um, Everybody has some role to play and some people are more central than others, but there's sort of a diffusion of the um, the artistic burden, so to speak. Um, Whereas in the symphony, it's very much the audience is detached from the performance. They're very much sitting in the dark, kind of witnessing the performance happen there on stage. Um, And so to me, rock and roll music has tried to to somehow reconcile this tension, right? They've they've sort of tried to bring the the participative energy of the the tribal ceremony into the concert hall. Um, And some artists have done that more successfully than others. And then now like modern music, whether it be rock or hip hop or reggae or whatever it is, they're all sort of basing their their model of, of interaction with the audience off of this rock concert. Um, and so to me, the question is like how, how to deal, like that, that's just how I'd frame the problem is like the, the dialectic between the African tribal dance and the European symphony. Um, and how does the meta modern artist bring in participation back into the performance that was lost in the modern world, right? I feel like in the ancient world, art was very much participative. You think about liturgy, you think about procession, like the place for music and imagery and uh, story, all of these things were, they were deeply participative, right? They were deeply sort of uh, in the fabric of the culture, whereas now we see them as these art objects that sort of happen within this isolated place, right? And so the artist, I would say, went from an artisan in the ancient world into a, like an entertainer in the, in the modern world, as well as like a there's like the artist took on like this prophetic role in the modern world, right? Because the there's this idea of like the romantic notion that we can come into contact with reality by sort of projecting imagination out into the world, right? So the, the art object took this sort of prophetic role um, onto the, the postmodern world in which the artist became an activist, right? Because like beauty and truth and this whole idea of reality sort of got deconstructed. And the role of the artist was just to, I mean, everything became about power, right? So the artist became a vehicle of power like everything else. 
um, and they were meant to use their art form to sort of affect power dynamics. And so the question is now, what does the metamodern artist do, right? And I would say that, that the task of the metamodern artist is to, to reincorporate participation and to bring the audience back into the art form somehow. Um, and so you, you brought up lo-fi as, an, as a, an example of this, which again, like I hadn't really thought of it that way because um, on the surface, it's very, it's not very participative, right? It's like lo-fi is generally produced and uh, listened to in solitude, you know, it's the whole image of lo-fi is like one person on the computer making the beats and then, you know, listening to lo-fi like in a, on a rainy day, kind of looking out the window by yourself, reflecting. Um, but I think that it is like, to me, what stands out about lo-fi is that it was created for a purpose, right? It, it's it's an act of ontological design, right? Like it's it's designed to put you into a certain state of mind what, rather than to project a certain uh, imaginal imaginary idea out in right it's not so much like i'm trying to express myself it's more about i'm trying to put you in a certain mindset right um and so the fact that it was designed with the context in mind and with the subject in mind that to me makes it very meta modern um also like there's deep there's all these like paradoxes within lo-fi music right because it's like i mean on the one hand like just, I mean, just in the name, lo-fi is, is short for low fidelity, right? So it started these, these people were sampling all of this low fidelity music, which is seen as low quality music, right? Um, and so like, there's just something very ironic about using these high tech, uh, in, you know, these high tech uh, sound engineering plugins and such to, to intentionally put in static and microphone noise and to intentionally use the quote unquote low quality music um like it's it's a full rejection of the sort of platonic ideal of like everything's perfect and clean and orderly um it's a deep embrace of the imperfection but also using like this sort of using high-tech perfectionism to to uh to bring the imperfection up into something greater um, and then just like the whole relationship between, like I think I've been thinking about the relationship between like the phallic and the matrical in terms of this. That uh, lo-fi comes from like it's hip hop beats slow down, and then you know they do other things with it. Um, and hip hop is like very much phallic, right? It's very much like the the voice in the center, and it's the lyrics, and it's very much like it's it's that central uh, center of it's cent it centers focus, whereas lo-fi is like there's no there's no lyrics in it and so it's this very diffuse matrical like it's meant to be sort of this background music right so there's the contradiction of hip-hop being very phallic and but then the the lo-fi being very matrical um there's like there's just all sorts of contradictions i don't know i don't know i feel like i'm rambling at this point i want to pass it back to you but that's my that's my introductory uh statements on lo-fi music well i appreciate that very much and it's interesting to me because there's this kind of question now just to, to op on what does art look after postmodernism, right? You have, me you know, modernism, you have postmodernism. What is, if we use metamodern um, as a phrase, what does that look like in literature? What are the characteristics of that in, say, architecture? What does like that look like in music? What is emerging as opposed to sort of being top-down design, right? Because that says something about the sort of collective consciousness of the culture that's going on. And it's interesting, too, because in the net conversation we had the other day, there was this conversation on the difference between, say, storytelling and philosophy, which is actually a fascinating topic uh, because there's a sense that if you think the philosophy is wrong, then it is a story. But if you think it's true, it's not just the story, right? Like all philosophies that are not true, you think are just a kind of storytelling, right? Not even good storytelling. They're just almost like a chronicle of ideas. Whereas philosophy that you think is true is not merely a story, even if it's structured. And so I, you know, that, that also got, I've been thinking a lot about that and also a historian figure named Hayden White who wanted to argue that all history was ultimately literature and structure. Now that's only say an insult if one assumes that literature equals false. Uh, but he wasn't saying that. He was saying, no, history is a genre of literature and literature is a valid form of truth. So, you know, there could be this argument that philosophy is a genre of literature, but that doesn't mean it is false, even if it has similar of designs and different things. So for me, it's always kind of interesting to look out on the horizon, if you will, on the kind of art and the forms that are emerging, because one, that is an insight, if indeed philosophy and story can be very similar 
in different way. And then I'll pass it on whoever wants to speak. Um, then what is happening in art may suggest some ideas, new philosophical ideas that are forming that have not been yet articulated into philosophical language, but are being felt like that, that are that are there that are trying to come to the surface that are still in an emotive way. And that's not an insult because ultimately the emotive is the most lived. In fact, you know, philosophy is just simply where we very often philosophy is trying to understand something we already know so that we get a better grip on it or trying to have a better sight of the territory so we can walk across it more clearly to the next thing. So, um, so art and philosophy are, are very tied together. So for me, the very emergence of lo-fi music, which you know, I, I, I'm, I was, I, I've always loved New Jabez, um, some of the Chicago, I think they call it the living room music and different things that I think is all part of this emerging, which kind of feels like a space that people are creating so that their imagination can go where it needs to go so that they can rest. There's a participatory in this sort of imagination. So it's very interesting to me and I'll pass it to Miss Harris. When Zach mentioned the metamodern artist, I think that's what you called it, um, when you mentioned um, like a bringing back, it made me think of all of these YouTube channels that have emerged that put together playlists of like classical music, but like bringing it back, but they do it in a very, very specific way. There's um, a channel I thought of, it's called Nobody, and I really like listening to it. And um, what they do is they put classical music together, but they put a theme to it. So they, um, <laughs> one was really funny. It was called the way that your grandparents describe getting to school. And, and it's like this very um, intense classical music. And there's a picture of like a snowstorm. <laughs> and, and then there's another one called um, You're a Viking high on mushrooms and that one is another good one but it, it made me think of that how all this stuff is coming back but in a very different way it, it, it's like in a way that's um uh it's almost like giving new life to these classical pieces that um was maybe lost before and now it's like being brought back like a lot of um, channels I see will say, oh, you say classical music is dead or you say classical music is boring. Well, I'm going to show you that it's not boring and that there's actually something to it. So I just thought of that when you said that. What you're pointing to is that music used to like all those classical pieces were composed for something, right? Like they would, it would have been written for a party or for a wedding or for a, an inauguration of something, right? Or a um, you know, funeral. And so, like the the music was was for a specific purpose, and it had a, a a specific atmosphere that it was trying to bring forth, right? And so, there would have been like part of the musical experience would have been appreciating the way that the the music fit onto the the experience, right? Um, whereas now we we just kind of think of music as it's like, well, I just wrote this song, and now it's out there, and just look at it and how great it is, you know what I mean? Um, and so I feel like what you're pointing to is that people are starting to to recover this sense of of fittedness, which is like the root of art is to fit together, right? AR is the the Latin root, which means to to bring together. And so it's it's saying, hey, this like this thing that you thought was disconnected from your life is actually connected, and look at how it fits in, right? And so I feel like that's I, I think you're right on with what you're saying. Well, it's funny to think, you know. When silent movies came out, for example, when they started silent movies, they could have just left it without music, right? And yet very often there was almost without anyone saying anything, there was like, oh, no, we, we actually need to add music. Like there's something that is not fitting per se if it doesn't have music. And it's also so interesting that there's this not uncoordinated but emergent um, tendency of people to say, oh, this track goes with when your grandmother went to, you know, when your grandparents went to school. Oh, this track is what you should do if you're at a wedding or different things. And it speaks to almost how on a subconscious level that people understand that an event is not fully itself unless it has some sort of music to go with it, that there's something about music that actually is part of 
um, almost a meta architecture, if I just throw out a $10 word quickly. Uh, there's like, it needs to be. And it's interesting as well that actually in the creative act, like we go on the lo-fi music, there's a sense in which people literally focus better listening to it. Like something that I do when I'm in whatever that place is I go when I do writing is take a track, same track, and it's on loop actually. And it just loops into a sort of trance thing. Uh, and it depends. It could be, you know, I, I've been known to go through very long phases of Max Richter, very long phases of uh, the funeral uh, John Tavern from the Tree of Life just on loop and then three years went by I was like oh that's the only track I've played for three years huh, that's funny uh, and actually I will say this for any for you know I've actually found that listening to the same song every time you write and doing it on loop actually trains your brain to go oh it's writing mode oh it's time to go into writing uh, especially if it's something like a Max Richter treat like an Infra 8 or um, I've, I've always liked the sleep actually his album Sleep which I kind of associate some Max Richter with a kind of lo-fi. It's not, it'd be interesting to kind of parse the difference. It's not, I don't think it has the hip hop element, but the neoclassical music uh, pattern, the track patterns on the Sleep album, you can put that in loop and go through three months and be like, oh, you finished an entire book because it creates, your brain gets almost like an association. Oh, this music's playing. Oh, it's time to write. And it's interesting how that to me feels participatory, which to me feels like a, a kind of music. Like you're saying, it's like, oh, this isn't a music that invites me in, in my creative process. Like it's pulling me in, in my creative process, not just to be the theme of say a wedding. It's a, it's the theme of the creative process itself. That's a, that's a, and that feels kind of interesting to me. And I'll pass it to, pass it to Ms. Will, Willman. I think like what I'm saying, you guys talk about music. I mean, I see a lot in architecture, like throughout the history of architecture. I think there's like, there's something else like prior to the history of music, music and the history of architecture. I think that compelled the Western world to take aesthetic objects and sort of disemplace them, um, whether that meant putting them in the gallery and as galleries became white cubes, you know, like, uh, it made the piece more self-referential or at least um, like gallery culture, culture referential. And then you've got music making its way into um, symphony halls and outside, you know, like you, you go there for a kind of like focused aesthetic experience that's like um, been detached from your life. And, and so if we're thinking of like lo-fi as coming back to like framing or atmospherizing or attuning you to a specific vocal action, which is in the case of lo-fi generally like steady, chill, like there's certain vibes you're trying to cultivate. Um, like I think, like I'm hoping that architecture will also try and um, recover this sense of like fittedness for life and framing focal actions as it was meant to do and like obviously like there's a sort of like um leftover of that just like in the common structure of a person's home you know we have rooms they're really standardized we have a living room a kitchen a bathroom a bedroom no one says rooms need to work like this but they're just that structure is so ingrained and you know, there are focal, there are focal actions that make a dining room a salient thing, and that's eating, you know, but um, yeah, and, and as we, as we move forward as a culture, and we have different, like, notions of what living is, and, and different rituals associated with it, like, I think in, um, like, in my office, we have a VR room, like, my work office, um, not this one, <laughs> And that's a new kind of thing, you know, like what, what does a VR entail? Right now it means an empty room with some um, ocul Oculus goggles. But um, I just think like as new focal actions sort of emerge in modern life, like you're, like you're going to need new um, instruments of like attuning you to that in like a full bodied sense. Um, yeah. The word vibes, I think, very much captures sort of what lo-fi is trying to create. And it's interesting because there's almost a sense that the more 
uh, that there's a less you could almost say like if we think of, of a Robert Putney, you know, bowling alone, the, the social capital collapses, places, infrastructure where you have a movement from the traditional family to the nuclear family. There's more now remote working where there's more if you're going to be in the same room. So the question is, how do you create a different vibe in the same room? Because you can't rely so much necessarily on finding a different space or going to different places because things are less um, less mobile, if you will, in the very way that people carry them out in the society. So so vibe becomes very interesting and it's also interesting to me where th there is a a sense of a music like when i think of what i always find interesting because I'm, I'm always interested in examining the uh phenomenology of the creative act like what is it like to be engaged in writing what is it like to be engaged in painting how does your brain work how do you see things what do you think about and i actually and i um and you know i i, I talk about it a lot how i actually think the phenomenology of the creative act is pivotal for philosophy to make some new advancement and, and so on and so forth but what is very interesting, i always find it very interesting i don't know about other people but i find that music that has lyrics in it actually makes it difficult to write like if it has lyrics in it, it's almost too distracting because you're like thinking about the writing and it and I can get lost in it. Now, if I listen to maybe like um, you know some of the the aria, uh, some of the different like operatic pieces, um, the uh, the that are more in Latin or German or different pieces, uh, like maybe a Saint Matthew's Passion or whatever, where you don't know the words, that funny enough does not throw you off because you don't know what they're saying and actually it can kind of be in the atmosphere. Um, I have, uh, like I, I had on Luke, uh, Luke Yoko Kanon Kano's version of Ava Maria and it's uh, outstanding and I don't know what they're saying, it's, you know, but it's fantastic. Uh, who knew that the Japanese could do uh, Ava Maria so well, uh, but, um, and it's interesting how there's like levels, like um, music that isn't a language that I know seems to throw off my ability to kind of participate in the creative act. Uh, music that is in a language I don't know, not so much. And then there's this interesting sweet spot of you can also have an instrumental, but it, it, it can't be too noisy, dare I say. Like it can't be too active as an instrumental unless say it's an active fight scene in the middle of the Sword of Tribulation. And then I'm going to be looking for say a Dances of Curses or something like that. Uh, so that, that will work out. So it's interesting, the different phenomenological experience in the creative act relative to the kind of music that is being listened to uh, and how that might be, if we're looking for a blueprint of what Meta modern music looks like, or the different way to kind of focus on and home in on that awareness of the different phenomenological experiences could be useful. I had thought of that, like, actually, like, just in terms of, well, I'm assuming that usually when you're in a creative flow state, like you're writing, and a lot of my work and creative work is done 3D modeling or drawing, in which case, I have sort of thought like there's maybe like a spatial part of the brain and a language part of the brain. And when I'm 3D modeling, actually like giving part of my brain something to keep itself busy with is like really, it gets it out of the way a little bit. So if I am like working on a model, I might listen to like a lecture. But then if I'm trying to write something, I could never do that, you know? No, I will, I'll add to that very quickly. I find it's actually very important to be super aware of the kind of music you're listening to and what you're doing. Like, actually, I find weed eating is better if it's music with lyrics or music that's more active in different things. Because I, because I almost... It's almost like I want to be pulled more out of the, because weed eating is generally more mechanical, right? And it's actually more enjoyable if you have music that are almost pulling you out more into an alternative world. Whereas when you're in the act of writing, you want music that makes you be in your creative world, not necessarily pulled out into imagining a story. Because I'll do that usually with manual labor. It's a time to actually think about the story or to think about like the thing that you're going to write out. And you actually want the full blown music to kind of take you into the story so you can think about it so that it's there in your subconscious when the next day you go to write it so it's actually interesting and then i'll pass it on that it does seem like the um the particular task that one wants to do has an impact on the kind of music that they listen to because the way you participate in it in the listening changes and actually like you were saying like i was uh, i realized that the closet was a disaster and listening to a lecture by mr nicholas uh while doing that actually made the task much much better i think it's uh it's really interesting that you like to write the lo-fi music, but Sam doesn't like to uh, 
or Sam, you were saying you like to do 3D modeling with music that has lyrics in it. Because I was going to say this about lo-fi. To me, there's a, a conspicuous absence of lyrics in, in lo-fi music, right? It's not like philosophy of lack. It's not just that there's there aren't lyrics. It, it, it's that like lo-fi calls forth lyrics, right? Because it's a hip hop beat. So it's like, it's, it's very repetitive and it's meant to, like it's meant to just be that, that background to which a single focus can, can uh, lay on top, right? Um, and so because that's not there and yet the beat is there, it's sort of like, it calls forth lyrics, right? And I feel like, I mean, to me, I'm I'm a songwriter, so like I know what it's like to be either listening to an instrumental or just like you know playing chords and trying to come up with lyrics for that, right? And there's sort of this sense of like, like okay, it's coming around again. Like here's the one. Do I have something to say, right? And it's sort of like this this like lurping thing. And I feel like lo-fi, just the structure of it. Yeah, you know I mean, it's like um, you were talking about music, like listening to the same song in order to facilitate a certain action, right? Like the word groove comes to mind there, right? Um, which is obviously a musical concept. And like the groove of lo-fi, it's the way it works is is there's a snare on two and four almost always, right? And that sets up the the pockets. So that's like the the moment that you return to and you sort of like when you like when the audience claps their hands, it's always on the two and the four with the snare, right? But then the kick and the hi hats are like all over the place, and it's like you can't you can't just do a steady eighth notes uh, rhythm with the hi hats, or else it'll just it won't sound like lo fi. It'll just sound like a like a boom bap hip hop thing, you know what I mean? Um, and so you have to intentionally like make it all like disjointed to give it this sort of like lurpy like the the image that comes to my mind is a, a river rock rolling down being pushed down a river you know i mean it's sort of like and and it's sort of like this rolling but uneven thing and yet the the snare keeps everything locked into that groove right so it's it's not so repetitive that you fall into like a, a rote kind of uh repetition but it is it's not so disjoint that you can't get into a groove and so i think it's, it's just totally fitting that that it would call forth writing from you in that like i think it's i think it is designed to do that and so i don't know i just add a little little music theory to the discussion I guess and I liked how um Sam was saying about how like she likes to listen to music with lyrics when she's doing her 3D designs um I I know when I do like an analysis of a story I have to listen to a certain type of music otherwise I'll go back later to what I wrote down and I'm like, oh no, that was completely off of what I was trying to say. Because if I'm not in, um, cause I do a lot of, uh, Kafka analysis of, and, um, it's not, those stories aren't upbeat. Like <laughs> and, and sometimes I just have an upbeat song on and I can't really, and because of that, I can't connect to the story. And that's actually what happened with, I did an analysis on the country doctor and I had to do a second video because I was like, Oh no, like that's not what I was trying to say, but it's because like, I have to put myself in a certain mood. And so music like, um, lo-fi, um, where in music, how you said, um, about how you listen to it in a loop, it kind of helps you put you, or it helps put you in the mindset where your mind sort of opens to these new that you would not have known before um and, and it's a weird phenomenon that like happens I was just thinking about your comment Zach and and how this absence of lyrics sort of calls forth um language maybe and I think that's really interesting because it's not that I'm gonna hold fast to what I'm about to say but I think one could think of music as kind of proto-language and um, yeah, so it's, it seems like an excellent prime, so to speak. Um, also then of course, like, you know, I think, I think the best writers are usually aware of the music of the, of, of their uh, word craft, you know? Um, but then I was thinking in, in the opposite direction, like um, Daniel, you were saying that like when you're doing manual labor, you want, um, like a different kind of music. And then I was thinking like, oh, okay, so um, like linguistic thought often re relies heavily on metaphor and where do we get um, a sense of a, 
a well-fitted metaphor is from the physical world. So if we're sort of like considering like, um, uh, you know, like a linguistic proposition and then we ask ourselves, okay, this person just said X, does that have a sense of rightness to me? Like working with one's hand in that moment might have, you might be more primed, so to speak, to have a better sense of like the fittedness of the, of the idea well, it's interesting because, you know, when one engages in the act of writing, which I use as the reference point, because that's why I do the most of obsessively, um, the, you know, you have these kind of stacks that one is dealing with, where there's the structure of the sentences grammatically, there's the structure of the argument. And then, of course, creative writing is so fascinating, because then there's even like a, another layer of the moving of the image in the sentences so that it's kind of fluid and how it fits into all the different stories. You know, when you're just doing a nonfiction piece, especially if it's not necessarily a imaginative non, you know, imaginative nonfiction piece, like you would see in a David Foster Wallace or something like that. It's just like a philosophical essay. You don't have to worry about the consistent movie, movie playing in your head. You have to worry about the consistency of argument, but that's not quite the same. Um, whereas when you're doing creative writing, there's these different things that has to stack up. But it's almost like what can end up happening is that when one is in the field or they're doing the weeding or whatever, you're in the place where you're imagining the story and the image level all matching up. And then when you go to write it, you've got that. And now you want to get into the sentence realm where you get into the flow that it goes and it can put. So it's like, it's because writing for me almost has like two different things that are going on. Like I always make this example. If I have a sentence and I say, um, let's take it from turn the world. And I say, um, uh, Don walked to her grandmother's uh, bedroom after after walking down the creaky uh, the creaky hallway. Right? Okay, you got the information. You know what happened to the story. This character named Don is at her mom's room. But the problem is, here's another sentence. It means the same information, but another sentence. Don walked down the creaky hallway to her to her mother's bedroom and opened the door. The second sentence is better because the information follows logically. You're, the, the camera was consistent, right? Whereas in the first sentence, you're at the door and then you're told she walked down the hall. Sure, same information, but the structure of the sentence results in the camera and the head jumping, or, you know, the, it jumps around. Where in the second, you follow Don down the hall. And when you're doing creative writing, it's very, very important that the movie plays in the head, but that actually means the sentences have to be written for the playing of the head. Well, that is something I find I can do better, like in the lo-fi place, uh, because you're see, you're just following, you're getting in the beat, you're keeping it. Whereas when you're in the chaos of the story generation, if you will, you want to have sort of a vaster thing. You don't want to be thinking about the nitty gritty of, you know, the sentence structure. You want to be thinking about what Don and George are going to do about these people floating in the sky and how that ties into the climax on chapter 30 in chapter 30 or whatever. So it's interesting for me, that kind of different stack of, of actions that occur. Um, and I wanted to note what I find very interesting about music um, is there's a sense that it has this ability to sort of structure one's thoughts or help an individual be organized or create a beat to the project that they want to do. And it makes me think a lot um, about Ulysses, like the mythic method that James Joyce did in Ulysses, because there was this kind of idea that he had a lot of episodes, but he needed to turn to Homer to give a structure by which to hold these episodes together. So you have Ulysses, he called it the mythic method. And likewise, you have T.S. Eliot, and I'll just use these two examples because they're premier modernist texts. There's this notion that there are no longer givens, God is dead, we don't have any meta narrative or whatever. And there's this notion, well, we still need a kind of structure uh, to hold things together or, all, or else it's chaos. You know, you know, T.S. Eliot in the wasteland, he turns to a lot of references of the past. He's constantly showing these fragments against these ruin, uh, these fragments against his ruin, as he says at the end of the wasteland, in the same way that Joyce is employing a sort of mythic method to structure chaos. It's very interesting where there's almost a way in which music can function as a kind of mythic method to the brain when it's engaged in creativity, where it can create a sort of structure around all of the different episodes that are going on in your head and figure out a way to hold it together into a co and whole, um, and that can make it flow. And it's interesting because that seems to be something that if we're if we're talking like Mr. Mr. Fishman uh, is is noting this return to a participation, it would seem as if a lot of that is in this creative act where you are participating in providing, you are choosing the music to then provide a structure for your creativity, but you are also creating that structure in that you are making it a thing that then fits these pieces. Like after you, James Joyce, Ulysses is never the same. It is now also the structure to the modernist text that James Joyce put, put, put out. On the flip side, and then I'll pass it on, there's also this interesting dilemma 
where one of the reasons I like lo-fi or that or some of the neoclassical music and I guess uh, Aflo Arnold's, uh, some of the Icelandic uh, composers come to mind as well who are geniuses, but Max Richter and different things. It's precisely because it summons voice. And so you feel like, oh, I'm going to put the voice of the creative act or the, the thing that you're working on. That is the missing lyrics per se that you're ins inserting into it. Whereas say, for example, anytime I would write to say like an Eric Whitaker, uh, I did choir for a number of years and like an Eric Whitaker, I always loved uh, When David Hurts, um, Sleep. Uh, I think Eric Whitaker is a genius. And then obviously uh, Joss Tavern, um, and the individual who did the Wacrium, whose name escapes me, that's a masterpiece. Um, I would always feel like there's almost something obscene to be listening to it as background music, as opposed to stopping everything you're doing and being like, oh, this is, this is when David Heard by Eric Whitaker, you know, this is a, this is like the breakthrough of the sacred. You need to stop everything you're doing and pay attention. Um, and it's interesting how there's some kind of music that it feels like you're using it and not really appreciating it, which is bad. But then there's other kinds of music that almost invites you in. And that makes, and that's where like lo-fi seems like it's different. It wants you to use it in a kind of background, dare I say, uh, setting. Uh, it's kind of inviting you to do it that way, which seems unique. And it makes me think, and then I'll pass it on to Sam, um, you know, with Sati, um, you know, he did the, you know, the pianist, um, he did the famous Gimma Fonti music song, dun, 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 you know, everyone knows it. But he created what he called, um, he called, I think he did call it actually living room music. And the notion was he could, he composed tracks that he wanted to play in the background as say people ate dinner, as people walked through the hall, as they read a book, like literally the tracks by um, Sat was uh, named so that people would do other things. He got so frustrated because everyone would stop what they were doing and listen to the music. He's like, no, 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 no. You're supposed to have dinner while the music is playing because the sound of you having dinner is part of the music, dang it. And that makes one think of like uh, 422 by, uh, you know, the, where they don't play any music or 433 or whatever, where they don't play any music. But anyway, he was trying to create music that was supposed to be background, that that was the music, but the world wasn't ready for it in a way. It was too, it was like at that period of time in history that it won't ready for it. Whereas now, maybe it's almost too easy to use music as background music where you don't really listen to it but then at the same time there's a need it seems for music that can be a mythic structure to people's creative acts um but yeah i always laugh when i imagine eric sati getting angry that people were stopping and listening to his music instead of going about their day i'm like not many composers tend to get mad about that but he was really frustrated <laughs> Um, when, you, when you were talking about um, music creating this sort of structure, it made me think of um, when I would train for um, cross country races, and I had one I had one coach who was super old school, and she was like, "You will not listen to music when you train. You will listen to <laughs> I know." <laughs> she was like, "You will." Um, listen to your breathing and your heartbeat and then just go off of that um and and then I had another coach who was like just listen to whatever you want when you train it's fine it's fine and and I can tell you right now that that the the one or us training without the music we did worse but when we trained with whatever music we wanted we did better and because the the music kind of um created the structure where it it helped our body move and it um shut out all the extra noise of like the crowds and um everything else to um or that like put off of our off our pace um but the music um I used it personally to like say if I wanted to run like seven minute miles I would put a really, really fast song on and I would like keep that on the loop. So I was on the, the same like rhythm all the time because that's what you had to do. But um, if you don't have music, then it's like there's no structure at all. And then you like, you feel your, your body be tired. I think you mentioned you were in cross country too. But so you like feel the pain but when you have music it's like shutting everything else out um so that you you forget you, it's almost like you forget that your body is there you forget the movement and you just do it 
uh, yeah, our wrestling coach was very cruel and made us do cross country. Uh, so I had like six years, you know, doing that. So, uh, yeah, about that. Every time you go to the starting line, you're like, why am I here? <laughs> what is, what is this? No, <laughs> I've not made good life choices. Uh, but it is, you know, it's very funny you say that because we were, you know, it's the same way where actually the music actually creates a sort of beat and you can forget your body. I find what you just said extremely fascinating because the very, it seems as if humans are at their optimal when they kind of forget themselves. You know, there's a lot of talk about being selfish, selfless, but I think a third category that Timothy Keller talks about is self-forgetfulness, where you enter the state of forgetting yourself and where he's talking, you know, he's talking like in a Christian context where he's like, you know, if you're selfish, that's bad. But then there's also a problem of like emphasizing selflessness, uh, where it can be like a pride and humility. And you're always talking about how you're worse than other people. And that has its own dysfunction. So it's like people get trapped between not being prideful, but then there's kind of a toxic humility that he talks about. He said, well, really, the key is a kind of self-forgetfulness. And he references C.S. Lewis, who kind of talks about like, you don't really think about your thumb all day, right? You just kind of use it. You have it and you use it. If you sat around thinking about your thumb, it would be weird. And also, if you made a point to tell people that your thumb was bad, it would be weird. Instead, you just kind of use it. So it's kind of a self-forgetfulness. And he's not talking about it in terms of a flow state, but I think it gets linked up to the flow state. And it also, I think, gets linked up to the nature of habit. Like a habit is something you do without thinking about it. But a habit comes from a lot of practice. What's very interesting about habits is you work very hard to get to the place where you don't have to think about it. Like that's always the funny thing with like art. You work really hard at an art to make it look like it's easy. Which then kind of sucks because people are like, oh, it's easy. And you're like, well, <laughs> you know, it's kind of that funny thing where it's, it's interesting how there's something about the right kind of music that can actually simulate or help one into a state of a self-forgetfulness that seems optimal for human flourishing, optimal for how people um, interact. And what's also interesting about that, you know, there's this real push in a lot of the meta modern spaces. Now, um, you know, Mr. Fishman and I have also talked about like Mr. Denver's understanding of meta modern, the, the liminal web, meta modern, which isn't very meta modern according to Mr. Denver. And I am a big fan of how uh, Mr. Denver talks about meta modern because I think it's, you know, Hegelian. I think it's very dialectical where there's an oscillation between modernist tendencies and postmodern tendencies in defense of an interior space is what Mr. Denver will emphasize, which I really like. Um, and so when we talk about sort of like metamodern music and thinking about lo-fi that way, there's a certain sort of oscillation between the music itself and you as a subject listening to the music and the creativity that flows out of that. There's a kind of movement between. And so when we're talking about metamodern art, um, a lot of that is this interesting sort of movement between. And what's interesting is when one engages in self-forgetfulness, that's actually where they have moved between them and the work so much that they kind of become one and yet they don't lose distinction. That's what's so interesting. Like, you know, Mr. Fishman was talking about like um, African music or the African dance or the, the, the drum circle. There's this way in which people kind of lose themselves and yet individuation is not lost. There's a harmony. I like to say there's a harmony instead of sort of like a unity that erases difference or different things. And so it's interesting how it's not like when you are in the cross country race or you're doing the marathon and you're in that flow state, that self forgetfulness. It's not like you're literally like forgetful where you trip into holes and trip over rocks and, you know, different things. What's so funny is in that state, you're like really quick in your reaction. You're very aware. You're like hyper aware. It's like you're super aware of the particular details of the terrain that you are engaged in precisely in this place where you're almost outside of yourself, which goes to sort of show that maybe traditionally some of our associations of awareness with success, maybe it's more complicated than that. Yes, it's a kind of awareness, but it comes from, it's in, an awareness that emerges out of a self-forgetfulness, which entails a sort of movement between something bigger and yourself, which are more complicated dynamics than can some, sometimes come out in maybe more um, traditional understandings of self-optimization and things like that. So I always, I always think what you're saying there, that's exactly right for me with like writing the music you like, you, oh, three hours went by. There's a kind, you know, there's a kind of self-forgetfulness that can occur in that. Makes me think of something that I was reading today, Nan Things, Byung Chul Han. He's talking about um, Heidegger when he's discussing uh, the Van Gogh painting of the peasant shoes. And then he quotes Heidegger, um, the peasant woman wears her shoes in the field, only then do they become 
are, they're all the more genuinely so, the less the peasant woman thinks of her shoes while she is working or even looks at them or is aware of them at all in any way. And like, like I get that, like this is, the shoe becomes an extension of the body schema and is forgotten and probably herself is forgotten. And, and the thing which is not forgotten is the work that she's doing. But I mean, with this, I, I looked at it and I kind of rolled my eyes because I mean, last weekend I uh, walked 10K in heels. Did I want to forget that my shoes were there? No, not at all. Like, absolutely not. <laughs> I am wearing those heels for a reason, <laughs> you know, and it's not to forget them <laughs> and it's not to not look at them. <laughs> like you really have to, you know, like the, a time and a place and the person, but <laughs> um, I just thought like, yeah, like there is this way in that like the song becomes like um, a part of the larger organ organismic situation of doing the thing. Can I just ask why? Why would you? Why did you walk ten k in high heels? That sounds like a, a mission. <laughs> well, I was out on the town, and uh, we went from cafe to restaurant uh, to shop, and uh, right that on. is how one does that. When right you I thought heels. I thought you were talking about like a ten k. I thought you did like a specific like <laughs> high heel marathon or something. No, um, it was just no. <laughs> it was like it was a whole day. <laughs> life on the town. That's funny. Um, yeah, I was like, you know, and I thought cross country was hard in tennis shoes. I was like, this girl's like, oh, I just did one in a high heel the other day. So, okay. So just a couple comments on, on what y'all are saying. Um, yeah, I think music, it seems like what we're, what we're getting at is that music can be a binding agent, right? And I think that that's like just the back to the, the definition of art, right? To, to fit together and to join together. I think like the the language of theme song also I think could be relevant here that like music provides a theme into which your particular activity can sort of be brought up and united into something greater than it. Um, like Dan, I thought it was really interesting that you're talking about listening to like epic like rock ballads while you were uh, while you're weeding, right? It's like it what that does is it allows you to turn an otherwise mundane thing into it's like I'm on like I'm killing these weeds you know it is like a, it allows you to to engage with it as like a, a quest rather than just like a, a mundane task because you're brought up into the theme of that song right so I think music definitely acts as like a like and and writing music too for me like when I think about writing a song it's always like there's always I'm trying to figure out what's happening in the moment you know what I mean it's like things are always sort of like like what's what's going on right now you know what I mean like something's happening in my life and I can't quite say it and then it's like a song just sort of descends and suddenly it's all like there's like this flash where everything sort of fits together right and then I have to go through all the work of like bringing that flash into into a body that can sustain itself in the world but um it like definitely just the the language of fitting together um theme I think theme is like a really important word here um going back to like procession too and liturgy that the music it's like if you hear think about the way that music like calls people to things right um like the, another another word that starts with ar or contains that root is alarm right so it's it's that which like brings everybody's focus up to a point um or like the call to worship in Islamic uh, cultures, or like Sam, you were talking about like I'd I'd be interested to know what you what you mean by uh, language or music as a proto language because I've thought this before and and you know I've got my own thoughts on this, but you said that as sort of a, an aside. I thought that was really interesting what what you meant by that. But anyways, that's that's I don't know. I just wanted to add that. That that so that idea, I think it's pretty intuitive in the first place, but in the second place, actually, um, I um, where like how I would speak to that is um, probably through the language of Charles Taylor in the language animal, to which he has said he will write a second volume, but which has yet to arrive. <laughs> Um, but at the end of the book, you know, he, he, so in the book, he goes through like two types of language use, designative and constitutive. Um, he talks about the history of the philosophy of language, really good book. Um, but uh, designative language use is sort of like encoding information in language. And I think 
you know, anybody who writes poetry would know that actually like language often contains a lot more um, than the communicated information. And that's why we get polysemy. That's why we get metaphor. That's why poetry is good, you know? Um, and, uh, and in it, when he looks at uses of language, which are constitutive, such as metaphor and things like that, he, um, and this kind of goes back to what I had said earlier about like metaphor being grounded in embodied experience. Um, there's, there is with constitutive language use, like a good metaphor, an intrinsic sense of rightness um, that, um, that is just sort of felt hap like kind of sensually or haptically. And um, uh, likewise, he, he talks about music, you know, there's, there's something being communicated in a piece of music. It's like, what is that? There is something being communicated when I walk 10K out on the streets in my heels, like it's a, it affects my posture. It changes my stance towards other people in public. And like, what quite is that thing? Perhaps like Daniel, you were saying it's, it's fuzzy still. It's on the horizon of human meaning, human social footings. Um, we don't really know what it means yet, but language might give the vibe or sorry, sorry, sorry. Music might give like the vibe that will become a, a, a sort of scene named human meaning, a philosophy maybe later, like, and in that way, I think like there's a rightness and there's like a certain feeling that can like grow, you know, that is how I I would describe music as being proto-linguistic or something. But again, like I had said, when I brought that up, like I'm not holding fast to that as an absolute truth that I want you all to agree with. It's just an idea. No, that makes total sense. And uh, I only ask is like, this is something I've thought about too. Like, more specifically, the relationship between sound, like the sound and the word, you know what I mean? And even like to a theological place of like, um, or you can think about it, you can think about it developmentally, right? The children learn that sound affects action before they learn uh, like proposition, right? So a child just learns that if I go, ah, the mother, the, the mother will come and take care of me, right? So ah, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's, there's no proposition there. It's just a recognition of the relationship between sound and action, right? Um, and then as the child grows, they go from ma to mom, I'm hungry, right? And the sound is formed into that word and they're, they're able to, to sort of bring clarity onto the sound and thus encapsulate it in a word and gain access to proposition. Um, and also, um, we are saying about music, setting a vibe like allowing you to say something that isn't fully propositional like i think i just um listened to this video of john verveke talking about the difference between lying and bullshitting um whereas lie like lying requires a commitment to propositional truth right if i say if you say where were you on the night of the 22nd and i say i was at home when really i was out robbing a bank i'm counting on your commitment to act in accordance with what you believe to be true so if I can convince you that some that a proposition that, uh, that isn't true is true, then um, oh, my lie is successful, right? But bullshit doesn't work that way. Like bullshit works by by changing associations, right? So uh, a like an advertisers will do this, right? Um, um, bullshit works by making associations, right? So uh, uh, advertiser will put a picture of a beautiful woman next to uh, an image of a particular beer in order to get you to associate that image and the feeling that goes with it with the product even though those two things don't have anything to do with each other right so it's not making a propositional connection it's not saying if you drink this beer you will get this woman because everyone knows that's ridiculous and yet it's making those associations and i feel like poetry and music does this like it's bullshit in the positive sense right because it's also a positive word like i hang out with my friends and we bullshit right um and what it's doing is we're not exchanging propositions we're not trying to convince each other that anything's true we're just trying to make a web of associations that we can then exist within and so i think music definitely does that um but yeah i'll leave it there oh i was just gonna say um when when you were talking see i'm about um like something emerging in the future it makes me think of um something that came out really recently 
and it's not not particularly related to music, but um, is these aesthetics that have come out where we're before um, it was like um, you had this like you think of the 2000s, but you didn't really like have a name for it, like a style or anything like that. But now, now you've got like hundreds and hundreds of like different aesthetics, like different themes that you can like just look up on Amazon or Pinterest. And there's these like pictures that just like fit in that theme where before there wasn't really um, any pinpoint it, even though we knew it was there and, and, and we could think of it. And, and I just thought it was really interesting how you brought up that point. And it just made me think of that. Totally. And I think like, well, hopefully um, that just like, it's why make art makes more things possible, you know, because first you have an aesthetic feeling as a reaction to an object, a sound, something, and then you decide that's really cool and you want to embody that type of coolness. And then you've got a new genre of music. And, you know, like, like you were saying, if you're not listening to, you can't really listen to upbeat music and, or like happy music and analyze Kafka, (laughs) then, you know, there might be like a new vibe space music scene that you can inhabit. And then it gives you a different idea on Kafka and yeah phrase that Sam used, uh, art is what is, um, art makes more things possible, I think is a really critical phrase. I really like that phrase. First off, the composer I was trying to think of earlier is John Rutter. It just came back to me. His Requiem is outstanding. His choir pieces are outstanding. Um, the other one was Cage, who did that 433 silent music weird stuff. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say on an oscillation, I always find kind of interesting. I'm actually very interested in the difference between, say, the music of a Brian Endo, who did discrete music, airport music, and, say, lo-fi, and sort of that electric music. And I should note um, that when the discrete music album after 30 minutes going through this blip music that you forget you're listening to suddenly turns off into an, you know, suddenly transforms into a new rendition of box air. It's one of the most sublime things ever, uh, which goes to show you that creating the space that kind of invites you in that you're kind of daydreaming and you forget. And then boom, this sort of breakthrough of this new divine composition of box air is truly an extraordinary experience. And I think about how, I think about that album often as an example of creating a space that invites you in and then introduces a vision. Not, you know, it like, it, it's kind of doing both there where it makes some of that creative space where you're working and then boom, you stop writing. It's like, I, I'll never forget that the first, because I didn't know that the second half of this album was this masterful composition of box air. And I remember uh, that particularly uh, because of that powerful invite in and then boom, the sort of breakthrough of something sublime. Uh, <clears throat> I've also been realizing, I went back and before as another little uh, uh, side note, I went back and reread Burke and I forgot that for him, sublime is very bad. And I've been using sublime and beautiful as uh, similes where for him, the sublime is the aesthetic death drive basically that gets into politics and destroys everything. And the social order is more organized by beauty. So I will try to be more careful in the future. You know, one reads these books 10 years ago and remembers them in uh, Sparknote versions of memory that makes them say things that then they regret forever and they can never take it back. Alas, uh, one one moves forward. Um, but what you were saying on art makes more things possible, uh, uh, it's very important, I think, to always realize that rationality is um, responding to its immediacy. Um, you know, it is rational right now for me to not turn the volume up super loud on this speaker thing to make you all deaf. It is rational for me to do certain things to not spill water on this cup. <clears throat> but rationality is within the immediacy. Whereas if I imagine a spaceship, because I have imagined a spaceship, it is then possible to maybe engage in the rational process of bringing that spaceship up. But if there was never the idea of a spaceship, your immediacy would never give it to you because there are no spaceships found in nature. And so right there, you actually see a very important um, back and forth between rationality and imagination, because imagination expands the space in which one can be rational about. And that's where autonomous rationality, which is when we try to be rational and only rational, ends up kind of destroying itself uh, because it has no material beyond its immediacy to be rational about. And this, to me, I think speaks to why philosophy has always needed the aesthetics. But likewise, aesthetics has always needed philosophy to give it that structure. But of course, a structure, you know, if I have a house, and that's it, it's a house. If I want it to be a home, then you have to bring the life to it. So that's where you have to have the art with the philosophy if you want to get from a house to a home, but then that would be a kind of oscillation, right? That's that kind of meta-modern. And 
what's interesting to me, the question to form that comes to my mind is what is it that lo-fi music is saying that people want to be possible? Like if the art is coming to existence, what is it that people feel like is missing in the collective consciousness that they want to not be missing? What is it that they want to see come into existence? Like you were talking about the different aesthetics. I find it very interesting. Like in a lot of me, like why is there so many like, the, you know, a lot of the popular imagery is like SpongeBob memes, you know, this kind of rugged sort of like messy, uh, you see it all over Instagram kind of, I don't even know how to describe it, but you know what I'm saying, like the mean kind of aesthetic that you see everywhere. This is very popular. It's very messy, but it's very raw, but it's kind of like witty, but it's also deconstructive and post, like what's going on there? What is, what is that calling out? Because every piece of art kind of points to something, like something that people want to be possible or they wish was different, which is a kind of wishing for something to be possible, that being the alternative. Um, so what are all of these kind of arts that you're seeing emerging? Um, what is that pointing to that people want to be possible that is not uh, on a subconscious level that they are looking for? Are they looking for uh, particular aesthetic experiences that they feel they are part of? You know, we're talking about how lo-fi has this kind of inviting element to it. Is that do we as a collective consciousness feel like our institutions no longer serve us? That our politics doesn't invite us in? That our economics doesn't invite us in? So we're looking for an art that we can be part of is, you know, when you have this kind of sloppy meme imagery, anyone can do that, right? You don't have to be an expert artist to take a SpongeBob screenshot and add some sort of um, witty line to it or to have it, right? So it's very inviting. So I can do that. So yeah, I wasn't allowed to go to a nice university, but I can do that. So this is inviting. So there's something to me that it's interesting to think of this kind of aesthetic that is developing that kind of feels like you, you can, you, you, you're allowed here. You can come in, in an age when institutions feel like they're failing people, in an age when people often talk about that they don't feel like they belong or that they don't have a place they can be part of. And that to me, in addition to lo-fi clearly having some sort of speaking to the creative possibilities of the human being where you listen to it and you can create there's also something about a belonging that it speaks to that i think defines the metamodern age a, in invitation because invitation and belonging go together if you are inviting someone is saying to you you belong here rather it's a trick or not who knows but you know it, it there's just something there that goes that and it's interesting to see and then I'll pass it on. Um, but it's interesting for me to think of it as this aesthetic emerging in an age when people feel like their institutions don't allow them in anymore, uh, where they don't feel like they can participate in the economy because, you know, they don't they didn't get a college degree, so they can't get a nice job. But this aesthetic is like, yes, I can listen to this and kind of just chill. Because what is chilling? What is like chilling say? Chilling's like vibes all say is like a kind of belonging in that, right? It's like, oh, this is the right, this is the fittingness. Fittingness and belonging go together, right? You know, this is fitting. So I, this is, this belongs together. This belongs together and I belong with it. And so there's this interesting way that this art is structured today that to me speaks to all of that, um, that I find very, that I find fascinating. I really liked how you brought up um, the concept of memes because that kind of like it emerged in like our generation. It, it was almost like um, like everyone who was creating them were were pointing to a truth without saying it out loud, and that's why they were so humorous. And, and it was something that everybody kind of was able to participate in because everybody kind of knew the truth behind it without it saying it outright. And, and, um, and so maybe like with the lo-fi music, it's like everybody's being invited into this new space to listen and, and have these possibilities to create. And, and not only that, but it's a very specific type of music where it's like, um, it's hard to put it into words, but it's like you, the possibility to create um, is for everybody. It Like it, it's at a certain frequency where it's like more people could enjoy it. I guess it, like, like it's like some people don't, really like classical music um 
and then some people are in and they're actually into rock or like some people uh don't like rap and they're into another thing but lo-fi kind of seems to be this like th this it gives off the sort of frequency where it's very like i don't want to say simple it, it's hard to put it to words but I, I i don't know if you know where i'm getting at with this I think that's part of it where like a lot of people, like exactly, a lot of people don't like classical music. Um, and I'll even say that I think a lot of classical music, it's funny, I don't find it, it's so bent on proving to you that it's technically advanced that it doesn't invite you in. Um, it doesn't let you feel like you can be part of it where say Mozart's Requiem, it feels like, oh, not only are you part of this, this is like speaking to the, you know, transcendent dimension of reality that you need to pay more attention to, dang it. Uh, so it's, um, it's very, no, I, I think that's very interesting to think of low frequency, like everyone, it's, it's, in, it's there for everyone. It creates this foundation. I'm enjoying this so much. I may keep you for three hours because this topic fascinates me. Uh, so, so just so you know, Mr. Fishman and, and, and Sam, please. Sam, other Sam, <laughs> just in response to what you said, yeah, like I, I had, I hadn't thought about that, but it seems kind of just funny that like a low frequency has like a really long wavelength and it's the type of sound that can travel really far and is like, sort of like, has like a, a wider horizon of like motion. It just seems like it, there's like a, there's a, um, it, like what you're saying, it kind of drives, I, I don't know, that's associative thinking, but I did want to say, um, Daniel, in response to when you said like, what is the thing that people want to exist in, in these new aesthetic, I don't know, realizations? I wanted to contribute another thought from Han, because I thought I read it today and it just seemed to really fit with what we were talking about. Um, it's the secret of a work of art does not consist in the fact that it hides information that could be unveiled. Uh, what is mysterious rather, rather is the fact that signifiers circulate without being stopped in their tracks by a signified. It is the secret, the su seductive initiatory quality of that which cannot be said because it makes no sense. And even if it were revealed, the secret could not, um, since there is nothing, could not, because since there is nothing to say, um, everything that can be revealed lies outside the secret, and yet it can be shared. No, I'll just comment on that. I, I think something that I always think is very interesting is, you know, obviously a lot of the development of music, historically speaking, is tied with religion, uh, and it's put to, it's for the churches, and, you know, Angus do is being, as you're going into the cathedrals or different things, where there's a notion that music always, uh, there's something natural about art being in service that it can point to and suggest, but can never fully capture, and that no signifier per se can ever reach. And one of the things, I'm glad you brought this up, because what it seems to me that's so interesting about a lot of this music we see in the meta modern age is that it's almost like the new thing that it's circling as a kind of mystery to give it power is human creativity itself or the human ability to participate in something while bodily sitting at their laptop and yet feel like they're not just there. As in there's kind of a two worldness that's going on in this sort of invitation that the, that the acts have because there is something, you know, all religions, um, First off, when we talk about mystery, it, you know, I think Flannery O'Connor's understanding of mystery is basically the best, which a mystery is something that the more you learn about, there's always something left to know. Mystery is not unknown, it's ever known. Uh, it is not a wall, but it's a road that keeps going. And so one of the things that a lot of the reasons art and religion seem to go together is because it's always like there's still something more to go that by definition has to be created. Like the religious horizon is always not yet entailed in the causal. It is not ever fully entailed in causation that. So it has to be approached creatively. Uh, it has to be. And art is 
the price, like basically if it's created, it's art, rather it be glass blowing tables, a home, you, you know, people talk about family as a kind of art. Now, I know we would have to get into the specifics of what is art. I understand that. But there's a human sort of impulse to think of anything that's created as having art. I mean, a lot of modernism is like, hey, man, what is art? Can it be a urinal? Now, of course, we have to get into what is art. But just the very impulse to feel as if something created could be art suggests something about creativity pushing the horizons of what is the current immediacy of causation to try to reach something that religion points to, right? And I think one of the great mysteries that is still around today, even after the quote unquote death of God. Now, of course, I'm not saying that there is not religion today, but I'm saying like collectively as a new mystery is human creativity itself. Like that is still quite mysterious to people as much as much as they may explain it with certain brain states or whatever. It is hard to say that those brain states are the full explanation of the emergence of it. Um, and so what's interesting is that you have these kind of musics and arts that seem to invite creativity. You listen in the background as you do your writing. You can, anyone can create a meme. You don't have to have gone to a, pre a, a prestigious school, right? Um, and, and also, a lot of these YouTube videos, anyone can watch them. It's not like you have to go to a gallery, right? You don't have to buy a plane ticket. There's something about the creativity seems to be what people are emergently realizing needs to be organized around to regain a sense of belonging. And that these, these forms of art what impression I have of them is precisely in the invitation to be creative while listening to them or to be the creative, because anyone can make a meme. You can share a meme, like to be creative. You see a meme, then you make your own. Like there's something like call and response. Hey, you do it. All of that is suggesting a certain formation around creativity as the new creativity itself. You see this, because obviously all art results from creativity, but it wasn't that like art would orbit around creativity itself as the mystery. It would be like you would create art for God. But now it's this interesting sort of meta dimension where it's self-referential, where the creativity is creating around the mystery of creativity itself. Now, of course, you know, maybe a Christian would come along and say, well, that makes sense because God's the creator. So obviously, ultimately, it would come along and have a self-referential, which is actually just the logic of revelation working itself out. So, you know, you can certainly take a theological take on it, but it's interesting to see that self-reference of creativity on itself and how that seems to be a characteristic of metamodern art. But Mr. Fishman. Yeah, so I think uh, in response to your question of like, what what are people making lo-fi for? Um, I think one, like an easy kind of cop-out answer would just be to say that like they are making it like that is what is being called for, right? Like the, the aesthetic is the answer to the question, not, you know what I'm saying? Like, is sort of an end in itself, but that's, you know, like I said, that's not a very good answer. Um, I think like there's, there's, I could go cynical with it or I could go optimistic with it, right? And for me, like the cynical view would be to say that what lo-fi offers is an, an opportunity to be bound to people, but without committing yourself to an identity, right? Because it's like, if you think about like punk rock, like, you know, to, if you say, I listen to punk rock, it's like, I know a lot about you, right? Like you're, you're, confine you're constraining yourself to a particular identity right you're you're um and and that's like we've been talking about that's what music does right it, it sort of brings things together um but i feel like in our culture there's there's a recognition that we are all fragmented and disconnected from each other and there is a desire to reconnect but there is a resistance to committing yourself to a specific identity right and i feel like lo-fi allows us to have that sense of connection through nostalgia, right? Because lo-fi is, is calling on that feeling of nostalgia. And so it's like, we're all united in that we're all missing something, right? But we're not united in what we have. There's no positive one in your philosophy of black language, right? And so it is, I think lo-fi is, is the closest we've come to like what Cadell would talk about as a, like a, neg a God as a negative one. Yeah, I mean, it's like, we're all gathered around our common lack. Um, and my point would just be that that's unstable. Like we can't, we can't finish. Like, I think that's a good, it's like a, it's a, an important moment. Like it's an important sort of like turnaround where we start to say, Hey, like maybe decomposition and endless fragmentation isn't good. Like maybe we do need to. So I feel like lo-fi, what it's doing in this specific moment is like, hold on a minute. Like 
do we want to go down this endless deconstruction road? Like maybe we could just like, hold on, you know, like, let's just like kind of like chill out and like think about it and, and not, not rush to a, a unity of identity. It's not like, let's stop doing that and go on this charge to the promised land. It's just, it's, it's kind of reflecting back on this deconstruction. And, and so the positive thing would be that it affords the opportunity for creativity, as you've been saying. Um, I, I think that, that that conspicuous lack, I think it does serve that purpose of drawing our attention to the common lack and inviting us and encouraging us and affording us the opportunity to, to come up with a positive movement out of it. But I would emphasize, as usual, that the positive movement out of the negativity is, is crucial and important and necessary. And that if we stay trying to be bound together to a negative one, it'll end in a, in a face mix. What you just said is really important because the moment something becomes conscious of itself as self-referential, it becomes a self-referencing uh, negativity that then automatically realizes its lack and then becomes an effacement. So this is the issue. You know, for me, lo-fi, um, a lot of the art to me is emergently suggesting that the creative act itself is the new, the new mystery, the net, you could almost say the new foundational mystery that people are trying to kind of operate uh, meaning on. And that will work until people <laughs> realize that. Because the moment you realize that, then you say, oh, that's what we're doing? Well, what, what are we creating? Why this? Why not something else? And immediately it loses itself. It's this really weird thing where the moment you see God, you're either dead or that's not God. Like, that's always kind of the interesting tradition that goes on in the Bible. Like, if you can see God, it's not God. And if you did actually see him, you're not here to talk about it. So there's always this interesting, the moment you reach the, precisely the moment of realization is when you're in trouble. And so uh, I completely agree with you where this metamodern art, if we call it that, seems to be my impression is that it is indeed trying to make creativity the new foundational mystery. But if it actually comes to realize that that's what it is doing, then it will become it will become an effacement. So the question is, what do you need to then make? Because everything is a doubleness, right? Like the creative potential of the metamodern art could be a very positive thing if it is connected with something that can stabilize it, right? Uh, but if it tries to be its own foundation, it becomes self-referential and everything self-referential is trying to be an A is A and everything that tries to be A is A becomes an effacement. It becomes a self uh, it becomes a self-relating negativity because nothing can relate to itself as a being without effacing itself because everything is actually a becoming. So there's an effacement that occurs there. So what exactly then uh, does metamodern art needs to be hooked up with so that it can become something sustainable? Well, you know that we speak a lot about, you know, you work on the garden, we talk about the, the, the new communities. There's something about where people like are trying to have creativity be source, like a source of family and not flesh and blood people. You put it very well with a lack of commitment. I think what we see in this metamodern art are these new resources of creativity that precisely because they can be so effective may tempt us to have them be their own foundation as a result become a self-relating um, negativity. So how do we keep that from occurring? Um, now, of course, if we follow a theological tradition, they would say, you don't, you know, if you don't ultimately hook it up with a theological structure, then it will become some sort of self-relating um, negativity. And, um, and that, of course, like if you're following, because art and religion go together so well, you know, historically speaking, there's always a notion that ultimately art has to serve some sort of, uh, has to serve really important phrase, serve a certain, like sacrificially serve a certain theological or metaphysical vision or becomes an idol. I mean, all of the idols, the golden cast, I mean, people forget, like if you look at the Torah, the building of the temple is an incredible a aesthetic act. You know, the building of the, the idols, the golden calf, these things, clearly people are not going to be worshiping idols that are ugly. You know, these things look good. Uh, these things were aesthetically pleasing. That's precisely part of the problem. We don't tend to have to worry about things becoming idols that are not pleasing to the eye, uh, that are not pleasing in some way. The problem is that the pleasure becomes self-relating. It becomes, it tries to be its own foundation and at that point becomes an effacement. So what you're getting at does suggest that this metamodern art as I think all art that's taught, you know, that doesn't ultimately have a sustaining vision um, has a certain expiration date. So then, of course, the next question would be, how does one make sure it does not have an expiration date, but is instead negated instead of effaced into a sublimation, if we use that Hegelian language, because I have a quota every conversation where I have to use sublimation at least once. Uh, so how does how does one uh, have it sublimate as opposed to efface? And Miss Harris. 
I have a question. Okay, so because uh, I'm trying to um, understand this, like, so if if we keep going, uh, talking about um, Zach's uh, the the pessimistic view, if we keep going um, down the path where we don't realize that we're self relating through lo fi, or do we? like end up losing our identity is that what it's a, it's a tremendous question so the moment like for example if i ask, if you've got someone who say has been a christian their entire life and you come up to them and you ask them why are you christian you know suddenly it's kind of like uh i don't know a lot of people would be kind of frozen like you're making them relate to themselves in their christianity and asking them why are you Christian? And it, and that can be freezing. It can freeze you because it's no longer given. You're like, uh, maybe I don't know. And you start thinking about it and you go into the philosophical journey and it can be existentially destabilizing. And if one ultimately is not able to connect their reasons for, say, being a Christian or a Hindu or whatever with some sort of bigger project beyond the just preposition, propositional knowledge itself, then it tends to hollow out and they're like, I don't even know, I guess just because my parents were or something. And that has a certain sort of hollowing out of it, right? So likewise, you know, someone comes along and they'll be like, why do you like lo-fi li lo music? And you're like, oh, I don't know. I, I, I work, you know, I listen to it while I work. And you're like, why do you listen to it while you work? It's like, because, you know, what I work on is important to me. It's like, why? Uh, because I'm trying to, to work on something that matters to me. Why does it matter to you? And you start going down this road where you realize you it doesn't really have a foundation. You do it because you do it, right? And in some ways, ultimately, whatever vision people live kind of has to be axiomatic, right? It, it ultimately has to have a non-rational foundation for why one takes the Kierkegaardian leap of faith. But when it comes to creativity, the question is the following. Can creativity, for its own sake, as its own sake, sustain itself? Or is that destable, unstable, as Mr. As Zach is saying, uh, because creativity is not robust enough in itself when it relates to itself to sustain itself as the foundation of why someone should be alive or creativity or other people. Can it do it or must it be, say, in concert with other actions and other things that then will give that uh, creativity more meaning because it's in a network of other things, say, maybe being part of a flesh and blood community, say, being part of, a, say, a work where you're doing something with your hands, not just with your minds that make you feel like the body is important. Maybe it's having a family. These would be the other questions that one would um, suggest because it would seem to me in my own work, we'll talk a lot about how the key is you can't have a single thing self-relate to itself and be its own foundation. It has to exist in a network, a harmony with other variables that work with one another. Uh, but then what that, what, the, what that looks like exactly, uh, one, one must elaborate on. Uh, but, but Sam, please. I guess I'm kind of here to say that I don't actually think it's a big problem. Um, and, and for the reason that you brought up, which is Kierkegaard, like you can oscillate between um, the dread of not wanting to be yourself and the dread of being one's own self. And I, I think that's a good analogy. And yeah, like eventually he says, like, you do need to take a leap of faith. And I also think that there's something like just existential about creativity. Like, I think it's like inheres in just the change of time that like it will always be there if it's you know like our relation to it um we can trouble ourselves over it but like it's a bit maybe um a bit too anthropocentric to to like worry too much because you know it it there's a sort of stability to like like life which has creativity in it that is beyond us you know well i'll just add real quick and then i'll let zach speak that i'm 100 percent in the camp that creativity is a necessary component of the process like there is something about the way that someone lives and carries themselves who is interested in creativity and carrying out creativity that is different than someone who is not so it seems to be in an, an utterly essential part for me, basically, the three things are the three infinites, if you wanted to put it, like beauty, truth, and goodness. And you have to have all three. Like if you have beauty, let's say because one is engaged in creativity, but one does not have a vision of the true, then they, do not they don't have a, 
a structure by which to hold that creativity up and it ultimately feels arbitrary. Also, someone could create something evil, right? You know, arguably, you know, something that always blows my mind is how obsessed totalitarian regimes tend to be with aesthetics, with the entire experience of the nation state. And it is incredibly aesthetically powerful. Uh, like I, I tell everyone, like you need to watch the, over, you know, the obvious example is Nazi Germany. I mean, my gosh, the aesthetic vision that they're trying to create with the music and the columns and the, you know, it's just kind of nuts. Um, so a lot of creativity there, but, and maybe, you know, here's another thing, maybe it could sustain itself. And that would actually be bad, you know, because you wouldn't want it to sustain itself. It would be better if it didn't sustain itself. So there's this, this issue that is, there also seems, Sam, and I should, I was not being clear, uh, there does seem to be differences between creativity that are in service that seem very philosophically informed and creativity that is not philosophically informed. There seems to be these different things. And there's something about these three that seem like they need to harmonize. But what exactly does that look like? And the question would be, we could put it this way, and then I'll pass it on to Zach. If the if everyone who likes lo-fi, such as me, comes to realize that lo-fi is orbiting around the mystery of creativity itself, and in, in that realization, there is a missing of all three of the infinites, and there's only one, then you will have an effacement. But if in that realization, there's a presence of all three, then it can be a sustaining creativity. So the question is, will one have in that moment an unveiling of the presence of all three of the, of the infinites or only one, and therefore you, you'll be missing out? But Mr. Fishman. Okay, so um, in response to the question of like, what do I mean by lo-fi? Like, if we don't if we don't move forward from lo-fi, it'll be an um, The way I would answer that is is like, um, Dan Daniel was pointing out that people turn to lo-fi music because it offers them a sense of belonging, right? And mu I would say that music does this in general. Um, but like, why I use punk rock as an example is that like that that really is an identity that like if you and i are both punk rockers it's like oh we're bros you know what i mean like we we like we have something in common that actually like binds us together it's like oh we like we're into the same vibe you know what i mean we're part of the same thing whereas if you and i both like lo-fi it seems to me that that doesn't really say much about us like i think anyone you know what i mean like lo-fi in in a positive sense it's very inclusive in that people from all different walks of life and different backgrounds and such can enjoy it. But on the, the pessimistic side, it's like, it gives us a false sense of belonging in that sense that we feel like we're belonging because we're part of this lo-fi thing, but we're not actually like, what does that mean about you and I that we both like lo-fi? It doesn't really mean anything. Um, I would say, um, you know, there are those who I'm sure who would disagree. And I'm sure if the more deeply you're into it, the more constrained you are by it. But at a, at, a, at a casual listener level, it doesn't, I think it gives us a feeling of belonging without the, the existential belonging. Um, and that, that if, if we mistake that feeling for belonging for actual belonging that binds us into a, into a body that can, can be in communion, um, that it, it will, it'll be an effacement because we'll, we'll think that we have it when we don't. And then we'll either just one day wake up and realize that it was it was nothing or more likely we'll be captured by some totalitarian regime that will come in and just split the mush of the you know, I mean, lo-fi is kind of mushy in that sense. Um, and so so, again, not not bad. And like I would agree with Sam W that um, like creativity is not going anywhere. Like there will be creativity. And like once, especially once we realize the lack and once we realize, um, like to me, this all comes back to ontological design, right? The idea that we can, we can influence our subjective state by making adjustments to our environment. Um, once that idea really comes into to, uh, the culture, we're gonna see this explosion of creativity. But as Daniel was saying, um, like the Nazis were very creative, you know, and, and they, you wanna, point to somebody who understood ontological design. Hitler understood ontological design at a deep level, right? The way that the colors and the sounds and the procession and all these things influence the, the human subject and, and bring us into a particular state, right? That's what, that's what religions do, but religion, yeah, I mean, like every, as Bard would say, everything's religion and it can go either way. Um, and so, so I guess that I'm kind of addressing two different, two different points there, but, um, that's what I would say in response to the, the two Sam. 
No, and I should also clarify by effacement, um, you know, uh, in, in our work, we talk about a effacement, not necessarily as like an erasing, but the kind of pathological collapse that can occur if there's a disordered relationship, which, you know, one of the reasons we use the term effacement is because a lot of times people would use negation in like there's a negation that's an erasing, but then there's a negation that's a sublation. And we find that we have found that to be a problem because then, you know, if you're using negation in a Hegelian sense, it basically always is tied to some kind of sublation or you'll talk about abstract the negation and the concrete. Well, what about like negations that can't sustain themselves or a disorder that seems to be an effacement? So when I'm saying, so when I'm saying that there seems to be a clock ticking before metamodern art self relates to itself in effaces, what I mean by that is before it becomes pathological and that could manifest in sort of the state in totalitarianism and different things like that. Um, I, you know, one of the great mistakes in, uh, in, in doing works is that one defines terms in these different ways and forgets to redefine them every single time. Uh, but, uh, but there is, there is something where art, like, because the moment, like, actually, to the point, like, if creativity realizes that it is its own mystery and foundation, then it might be like, dude, we're like God, because we can do that. So we can create the perfect state. So we can do anything we want. And that can lead to totalitarianism. And I would call that a kind of effacement, because then that is disordered. And by disorder, I also have in mind St. Augustine, who always says, you know, in his mind, everything that's created is good because God is good. So if he created it, it's good. Therefore, evil has to be a result of a disordered good, that nothing that exists is evil because if it exists, it must be good. Um, so if there is evil, it must be a result of a disorder of good. So disorder is foundational for privation and evil and different things. And that's why I link it with effacement. Um, but but there is what what's interesting to me as well, this point that Zach is bringing up, it is interesting where, say, if I said, oh, I like Leonard Skinner because Free Bird is awesome or Simple Man or what about Running Like the Wind with the, the, the you know, that one always gets me like, uh, can't you see is so popular, but, uh, but, but Running Like the Wind is so tremendous by that band. Uh, Marshall Tucker, I see I'm doing this thing where I'm having a lag now because I'm old, where it takes me a minute to remember it and like it takes me 10 minutes. John Rutter, Michael, freaking Marshall Tucker, Running Like the Wind is amazing. Or if I were to tell you that I like the Allman Brothers, that 20 minute version of Tied to the Whipping Post where they went crazy on the stage. Man, that's some good, that's some great stuff. Um, that says something about personality that's saying I like lo-fi does not. And that's really interesting. Whereas I don't, I do think my dad doesn't listen to lo-fi. So there is some bracketing that occurs, but it's almost like lo-fi telling people you listen to lo-fi just means that you work all the time because you're in modern capitalism and you have no choice but to be at your computer. <laughs> so there's something where now it's, it's funny how lo-fi, I am interested. It's a little bit of a different topic of how lo-fi speaks to the modern work life and and what that says on like your like everyone talks about flow states because you're supposed to be more productive at work because there's a way in which flow states you know it's always like nice and happy because flow state you're doing your creative work and the corporations are now like using meaning and flow states and whatever whatever to like you know increase profit margins or whatever so it's it's interesting how everything can be double right everything can be good that goes back to i think augustine's notion of evil is very useful because flow states are good if in the right order but if they're in the wrong order they're disordered there there's nothing that can't be bad because everything can be disordered. You can't think of anything that can't be potentially bad because everything can be disordered. But likewise, you can't think of a thing that is necessarily bad because it can be in the right order. This is the revelation of Augustine that I think is very, very important that we've sort of missed. Um, and um, and so, you know, so the question is, what is the order? And that's where, for me, the three infinites, you know, the right order is found in the presence of those three. Now, what that looks like gets into the details of the thing that one is discussing, but one goes to that. Um, so it's interesting to think of how lo-fi seems to be losing a certain communal or identity with it, which in some ways could be good because it's more open, right? You're not so, like, cut off from other people because you like Southern rock and they like the Eagles and the Eagles are not a Southern rock group, dang it, so get out. Uh, you know, everyone likes Hotel California, but that's not Southern rock, so get away from me. Um, you know, that there's a kind of brag, but if you're open, it's like, oh, lo-fi, oh, oh, you like to create too? Oh, I like to create. Oh, there's a connect there. That's really good. But then it's like, create what? What for? You know, and, and is it too atomizing? These are the interesting questions that arise in this um, emergence of metamodern art. To me, it almost just seems like a kind of situational, like, um, origin. Like, you know, you've got you've got a fragmented world. You know, like everybody's. It's like you know to borrow Slaughterdyke's term. It's like a foam. You know, rather than a sphere. 
Um, and then you, but you have, you have the internet, you have copy and paste, you have one file that can be in a, a million years. Um, so it's like, you know, like if, if you have all these, these foaming ears, just to get really weird. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, you've got like, uh, you've got one platform YouTube that a lot of people are going to log into and they want to find something with like millions of views that will pop right up at them. You know, like you have an algorithm that wants to like have one thing, you're going to get something really like accommodating of all of these. And maybe that is the sort of meta connection, you know, like it, it, it includes the foam. Like what, what you just said, Daniel, about how like uh, being into lo-fi might indicate that we're into creativity, but create what? I think that's really key is like, um, I mean, the question is, is we are gathered here today in the name of what, right? And like, if we are to be gathered, we will be gathered in the name of something. And so if we're gathered in the name of jazz music, then of, of creating jazz music, I should say, to bring creativity into it, then we can like that facilitates a communion because it's like, oh, you play the guitar, I play the trombone, like we can work together. But if if our, our binding principle is is merely creativity, then it's like, oh, you're an architect and I'm a musician. And so it's like, can we work together? Maybe. And like the, the possibility is that we would and like you would design a building and I would create an atmosphere and that would be awesome. And like that would be the positive potential of being more inclusive. But the the risk is that we think that we're connected, but then when it comes down to actually like working together, there's no, there's not enough. It's the same, like when I hear people talk about like integral, you know what I mean? Like integral theory, um, like the, uh, the irony to me is that integration is not an identity that can integrate people, right? It's like um, all the traditional religions, Buddhism, Christianity, whatever it be, like Christianity is an integ integral religion in that it takes different things from philosophy from culture from history and it integrates them into a common identity that people can enter into communion within um but integration doesn't do that is like you know what what how how does being integrative it being integral afford us the opportunity to take things that are disparate and integrate them together right so i guess it would be the same thing with creativity it's like if we're all together because we're creative um it's like what are we creating just as Jan daniel said so anyways yeah that uh, to me that that would just be like the clarification of the point um where like you sam w said said like well i don't see it as a problem that you know like getting creativity into motion um i don't see it like i don't see it as a problem per se it's just it, it's a challenge you know it's like how do we figure out to me, it's always just this relationship between like above and like identity and body. You know what I mean, like I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a Platonist in that that I don't like. I feel like Pla Platonism is is pop is top down without the bottom up. Like it doesn't really take into account how the the substance influences the form. Um, but I, I think very much in these terms of like how do we get the identity and the body fit to each other. Um, and I think I, I just I would just point out that I don't think that creativity is an identity that can hold a body in the world. So that's what I think. One of the things I think about is because it seems very clear. Um, so we're just going to talk for three hours because this topic is really important because this one really, really fascinates me. Um, and there seems to be differences between, say, creatives who are like super committed to the creativity for sweat sweat blood and tears where when those people say like i'm creative and you, you're talking to those people you're like that seems to signify identity and a certain sort of yeah i can rely on this person because they followed their art to the point where they've been rejected by the society they didn't take the promotion at the other job and they paid a price for it then there's the creativity that seems to be the kind of just free association. It's not really restricted. It doesn't have any limit. You're just doing it for fun, right? You're just creating, but it's just fun. That seems very mushy. Oh, and by the way, I really like the idea of lo-fi music as the music of the phone. Yeah, I'm gonna, that's a good thing. Because I was, I was rereading the Spears. I was trying to incorporate that into philosophical development. But the phone, lo-fi is the music of the phone. I'm going to use that. Uh, so that's good. Um, but there's interesting because I'm, I'm very interested, like, um, that came out of the philosophy of lectures or some conversation with Ebert on what I want 
want to call like a real choice. You know, there's a lot of people today that talk about like, how do you, it, nothing feels real. Everything feels kind of fake. You know, it all feels like a matrix, right? And this is where for me, like, there's a, a great thinker. He passed recently, uh, Charles W. Mills. He wrote a book called Blackness Visible. It's a very fascinating book on African-American philosophy and something he pointed out. He said, if uh, your life, you know, if you're a slave and your life is defined by what other people want to do, you don't ask if other people exist. You know they exist. You don't ask if the world is real. You know it's real because the world forces you into a certain conditionality. And the whole idea of asking, how do we know that the world is real? Or how do you know other minds are out there? Suggests a certain privileging of one's condition. And I thought, and that is very interesting because it suggests that the questioning of reality and sort of concreteness is tied to the feeling that something is unchanging or something is forcing itself upon you. And to put that, you know, um, to put that in a different way, it would seem like if you truly commit to something that has a similar action where you make a real choice, where not only do you choose, say, to go into art, but you say, no, I'm going to stick this through come what may, will you make it real? Will you kind of bind yourself to it? You know, and then it feels very real where one of the ways you make the world feel real instead of a simulation or something empty is to really, really commit yourself to something. Uh, like you commit yourself to a family, like you have a family, so you're gonna raise it. Well, they're very real. These children are real. They don't come in and out of existence. They are there now. You are bound to them and you don't ask, like when you are in a situation that has, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to say that having children is slavery because that might be what people are saying, but there's no, you know, be hearing, that's not what I'm saying, but there's a notion that they're very actual. Um, and, and the world feels very actual compared to say back in college where there's kind of choice and you can do different things. Um, but you know, once they're concrete or once you've decided like you have a house or you have a farm, you have to manage there's a certain reality that comes to it. And definitely one of the things that kind of binds parents together, for example, if I use that example, is knowing that, oh, you're in the reality too. Oh, you're in the real too. You're in this world that you can't escape too, in a good way, because actually funny enough, everything has a double. Like if you're in a world, like one of the things that drives people where they're sad is they don't actually have anything that feels tangible and real because anything is possible. But then of course there's the, oh, I'm in this now. And there's a kind of, everything has its own benefits and challenges, right? Like once you have kids, you don't have to wonder, you don't worry about the simulation hypothesis, but then you go, oh, I, this is a big responsibility. But there's a funny thing where that level of a real choice in kids actually does have a sort of binding principle with other parents that have done that because like, oh, you know what it's like to make a real choice as well. Oh, you know what it's like to really, really be bound to something. And I am not saying that only parents make real choices. I'm just making an example of that being a good way to sort of capture the point I'm trying to make. So likewise, it would seem as if creatives who make a real choice about creativity, like they're creative and they're pursuing the true, the good and the beautiful, like there's something about a real choice to be creative that turns it into something true and also tends to direct it toward the good precisely because it is so bound to the concrete that has this way of bringing it together. So there's something about it's almost like if you make a real choice regarding creativity, then you're being creative for the truth, for the good, for the beautiful. Now, of course, the issue is, what are those? What, are, what exactly are those? But this gets into the Hegel point of you have to tarry with the now. You have to tarry with the actual. Will you wake up every single day and you say, I am going to work in the particulars of the vision and what we're talking with and see how that plays out, how that unfolds in, in the now. And there seems to also be a difference between almost a vision and a plan, where a plan is like, this is our plan of what we're going to do and we're gonna force the world to conform to it. Whereas a vision is something where on the territory right now, we're going to figure out the map as opposed to bring a map to the territory and then see what, what that looks like. Um, so there's something about where commitment, a real choice to creativity, has a does have a binding principle in a vision that people are committed to realizing and folding in the now. But then the question is the following: Can everyone do that? Will that only work for a small group of people? You know, what are those people who do that? You know, can it be a universal identity or must it be more of a tribal thing? And does that in of itself, you know, that's very contingent because, you know, the, the real choice I just described is one that you can think you've made a real choice, but then, you know, two weeks later, you may change your mind. So it doesn't, it has a certain um, fragility to it that may break if, say, the social, you know, if inflation rates get 
quite terrible and the economy collapses or something else. And then you might find that you're not as committed as you thought. So, um, you know, those things can come out. But it, but it, but it's interesting to Sam, Sam Willman's uh, question, Miss Willman's question, or the pausing, because there does, I think about this a lot on the difference be between, it's clear to me, I get, it's clear to me that creativity has very positive impacts on people. It can, at least. Uh, there's a way that people, a mode of being, if I use that language, that people have who are creative that is distinct. Um, but there also seems to be different kinds of creativities or creatives, if we use that language. People who have made it a real choice, people who are very serious about it, who almost view it as a matter of life and death. Like, it's like, it's literally a matter of life and death to take this stuff seriously because it impacts how you carry yourself in the world and how the world thinks of themselves. And that seems to have a big impact that might be more binding um, when you take, when you bring a certain seriousness to creativity or a certain real choice to it. So um, all of that was to say that, that, that the commitment element, which maybe you could even tie to Nietzsche's Amo Fati, like love of life, like a certain sort of love of faith, sort of a love of creativity, like I am going to be engaged in this practice and I will surround myself with other people who are going to tarry with the now and come what may, dang it, uh, that that seems to have a, a binding possibility to it. And there's a vagueness to it all, but if you think about it, religions have a vagueness to it, them all, and they work. Like, who is this God? Who is Jesus? How do you interpret the Bible? Like, you know, how do you interpret the Torah? There's a vagueness to all that, but there was a common commitment to continually meeting in the same space and trying to figure out what this crazy book is saying, trying to figure out the right interpretation, trying to sort of tarry with the now, tarry with the negative. And there's a commitment to the unfolding of what that looks like. Oh, and we're going to put our money on it in donations. Oh, you know, we're going to put our money into it and our time and figure out how God's providence is unfolding in history. There is a kind of vagueness to all that. And yet it seems to have worked. <laughs> it seems to have at least worked better than some of the things that we've done. And of course, it had negatives to it, obviously. But it seems like that commitment element, that deep, deep commitment element can have a certain foreness to it that is, that is beneficial. Uh, but that seems to be a pre prerequisite, at least. I kind of feel like I would take everything you just said and like put it more into a language of love, you know? Um, because I think that really kind of makes the childbearing and the art rearing really the same thing. And also like commitment, like creativity could be um, a grand decision or it could be like a long enduring attentiveness, which is more like love, you know? Um, yeah. No, I, I think that's outstanding. Uh, and I always really think very highly of James K. Smith's book, uh, You Are What You Love, where he says what you love is what you make your habits relative to, uh, that what you love is um, forms your habits, and also what you love is relative to the, the daily liturgies that you interact with. So, for example, when you go to the mall, it's working on your love. Uh, because, you know, the mall's working on the things you like, which then changes your habits to go into spending, and then you become somebody who goes to the mall in their free time. So there's a connection between liturgy, love, habit, character. So those things all kind of go together. And so religion would create liturgies, which would be spaces of worship, you know, Mr. Fishman has mentioned this, which would then change what you love, which would shape your habits, which would shape who you are. And so there's something about what you're saying, like a certain love, of the creative act or loving in the creative or the loving of the daily unfolding that then create people of certain kinds of habits because of the daily liturgies that they engage in that then make them able to commune in, in unique ways. Uh, and so I think love is a very helpful language there. Yeah, and I think it, it kind of, maybe for me, I think it would clarify the difference between having a vision or having a plan. I think a plan can kind of stand behind action and go to onward in a directed fashion, whereas a vision stands more so, it's like the bullshit where the plan is the lie. <laughs> like it stands in front of the action and seduces it forward. You know, like when when someone has a vision, they're not going to execute it without a certain amount of like attentiveness and love. And um, like a vision only works if it draws. A plan, a bad plan can be really tightly executed even without uh, love, but a vision could. Maybe I have something to say here. Um, 
So first of all, like I've, I've got this idea from this guy, Jonathan Pajot, that like he gives a, what I think is a good technical description of love, which is that love is the, uh, the capacity for union that doesn't destroy separation. Right. So like you can have, you can have the kind of union with like an apple when you eat an apple and it just becomes integrated into your body, the apple is destroyed. Right. But then there's love between whatever, you know, between father and child or between lovers, whatever it is, um, which doesn't destroy is, is the possibility for, for communion as opposed to union. Right. Um, with the, the maintaining the separation. And so I think, I think that's totally spot on to bring that language into this. Um, and I think that adding to this, like, I also think what you said about vision and plan is really important that like vision, um, vision is non-propositional, right? A plan is a, is a proposition of like, we should do this particular thing. A vision is sort of just like, a like, we're going this way, <laughs> you know, is it's not, is not a proposition that can be fulfilled per se, um, though it does afford the proposition. And so I guess the word that I would bring into this though, is name when, when Daniel talks about like commitment. Um, it's like, yes, religion is vague. Like we don't, you know, you don't have to know what God is to be gathered in the name of God. Right. But like that, it is the name which affords that whole process of figuring out what God is. Right. Because, um, and, and like with love, it's like, you can't love, you can't just love, right. You love something or somebody, um, and you don't, you don't, like, do you ever really know who somebody is, right? Like, so you may not know who that person is. And yet, in order to engage in the, the actual act of love, you have to, to name that which you are directing it towards. Um, and so to me, when Daniel talks about like a real choice, it, to me, it all, it all comes down to worship, right? Like, are you willing to worship in the name of whatever, whatever it is? I would like the word I use is God. Um, are you willing to worship in the name of God? And, and like the fact that you and I may have different ideas about what God is, is kind of the point of the worship, right? Is that it for, it's like, Hey, like you're saying like, we're both worshiping in the same name. And yet you and I have very different ideas about what that means and what the implications of that are. Um, and so we need to reconcile that because, because we're using the same name in order to, uh, delineate our action. Right. And so to me, the, the commitment goes hand in hand with name. Um, and that, that sort of, I, I guess I would, I would propose name as the basis of, of an identity um, that can, can hold a loving communion. Well, that makes me ask the question. So can creativity be the name of a sustainable and continual worship? Like creativity, can creativity itself be the name of a sustainable and creative, you know, a, a um, communal worship? I I would say I would say the creator can be the name, but um, like the act of creativity, no, because there are, as we've been saying, there are there are creations which are. Um, which are in keeping like there are, there are ungodly creations i guess is is the simplest way to put it right and so like to be creative is not a a delineating principle oh sam's leaving goodbye sam sam you're awesome samantha harris not that's not uh not the other Sam Harris. um Sam is a great name. We have a very, very good collection <laughs> of Sam's. Nice collection of Sam's. Astound, outstanding. A communion of Sam's. Yes. Said, a loving communion. <laughs> um, let's see. I don't know. I kind of, oh, can creativity, can creativity bind us? Um, I don't think so. I think, I think the creator can, because like that, that proposes a will and a, like a standard of judgment, which is beyond us. Right. Whereas creativity, creativity doesn't offer a standard of judgment. I guess that's really what it is. This is like, I create this and you create that. Um, and there's only space for one of them. Right. Um, like one of these two songs will be played at the gathering of our community, of our uh, community. So what will that song be and how do we how do we make that judgment, I guess, is the question. And to me, 
which is the most creative it's like that's not it's like what do you mean what's the most creative like do you mean the most eccentric the most like what do you mean by that right um whereas like to me the word godly like what is the most godly of these two songs that is something which can be like we can create uh I don't think you can create like a propositional system to answer that question, but you can create an embodied sense of, of what is godly and what is not. Whereas what is creative is kind of like, it's kind of creativity is kind of yes or no, right? It's like either you are creating something and thus are creative or not. And so I guess um, if we want to have an identity about uh, centered around creativity, we would have to define what is like, how do we decide what is more creative than, than what um, in order to establish that hierarchy, because there must be hierarchy. There will be there will be variation, and from that variation, one thing must be selected to the exclusion of others. And the identity of the communion is that which makes that judgment. Um, and I don't think that creativity is a standard by which that judgment can be made. That's what I'd say. I think like we need to bring the mystery back into it a little bit. Like I think there's an idea in which and it doesn't a answer literally what creativity is, but it metaphorically rings true, is that creativity is a gift, you know? And it's like a gift of mysterious origin. Um, because, and I'm also tempted in just responding to think of Charles Taylor and his ideas on religion the idea that like we're actually not less religious we're more religious and we're more variably religious and we forget that our religions are or our religiosities are religious <laughs> i guess this, this is a, yeah um and i also think like there's been like in in like everyday language use we've kind of shifted our our use of the word God into the worst or the use of the word um, universe, which is sort of like creation rather than creativity in a totalizing like one sense. Um, just, yeah. Well, yeah, I would, I would totally agree with you that creativity is a gift and that there needs to be like, I, I guess what I'm, um, maybe, maybe it's important to separate like the, the creative act, from like creativity as a quality, right? Because I guess all that I'm pointing to is that like um, in any in any body there has to be there has to be hierarchy. There has to be a, a principle by which you include this but exclude that. Um, and so like if we're if we're punk rockers, then it's like we have a, a system to know this is cool, this isn't, right? Like mohawks or, and obviously there's all sorts of discussion. It's like, you know, is short hair punk rock or, you know, I mean, would, uh, oh, what's the, Henry Rollins, when he cut his hair off, it was like this whole thing of like, you know, he's in his Green Day punk rock, right? Um, but those questions are what make or break an identity is like, do we include this in our group or do we push this away from our group? And, uh, if you're going to do that, there has to be a standard by which you do that. There has to be some some delineating principle, right? And so I think that, like, yes, there's there's certainly deep mystery to creativity and and a gift and all that. But but does does creativity allow us to make those distinctions? Does it allow us to say what is in our group or not? Right? I guess that would that would be to me the question, and maybe so. But I I don't I don't see it. There's a few things. I mean. Um... You know, so for example, one of the reasons Occupy Wall Street had trouble is because when they started to have to say what they were for, uh, then people kind of got upset and it was exclusive and then it fell apart. Like if you don't exclude, it's hard to order and hold together. But then if you exclude, you're excluding. So there's always this sort of tension, right? Like you have to, like the difference between exclusion and definition is nothing. Uh, like you have to exclude if you have definition. And if you don't have definition, then what are you? So there's a problem, right? So there's always an, an excluding principle or there is nothing there to be inclusive. And in the same way, there's an argument, you know, what is being asked is something similar to, to what I think people have, have attempted, which is for inclusion to be a binding principle itself 
you know, it's kind of asking can creativity be a binding principle. I think people have attempted to make inclusion a binding principle. And of course, it seems to not function because then inclusion of, it, of itself is not a community, but something of which a community does. But that means there has to be a community there to include. It cannot itself be the, the community. An act cannot be the state. Uh, and so what ends up happening, there seems to be an issue of can creativity bind? It's like, well, well, that seems like it lacks enough of definition to have an exclusion and an inclusion principle. So then there's the notion of can a creator be a binding principle? And you would say, yes, religions have shown that. Uh, then there could be the question of can creation like the universe be a binding principle, right? Can like creation do what a creator does? You know, because people are attempting that when they're saying that the universe or being or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That those seems to be option. I am particularly, um, you know, it, 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 it would seem again, that there is something about the creative act or the engagement of creativity that is incredibly um, important. And I think, I think, you know, one of the things I wanted to say is that before I keep you for another three hours, because you people are fantastic, is that, you know, a lot of times when people talk about where did meaning come from, because we're in a meaning crisis and people see creativity, the question of creativity tied to meaning, they'll say, oh, you know, there was a monkey and there was a bush that rattled and it meant there was a, um, a, a predator. And so they came to say, you know, moving bush equals predator run. So that was the origins of meaning. And that's where meaning came from, you know, and, the, and today we're basically always trying to figure out what things mean and therefore we're looking for meaning. And so that's kind of the evolutionary history of where meaning came from. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think, you know, maybe the a shaking bush could be the suggestion of the birth of the signifier signified, you know, if you want to get onto that. But meaning is kind of different because meaning, say, religious meaning transforms the meaning of everything. It's not bound to say just a shaking bush that then means there's a predator. Like literally what that bookcase there means if God exists is different. Like everything in creation gets a new color that is not contingent upon a certain linear cause and effect of an object, meaning there's a predator. This kind of meaning, I don't think, is what I think, because when we're talking about art, like there's this interesting thing is like when you're weed eating and you put on the music, suddenly you're freaking at Helm's Deep. The meaning of the weed eating transforms relative to the music, right? The meaning of it, the meaning of the action, what is going on transforms. So likewise, like when people engage in art, it has a way of training you to engage in the world as if any given thing is part of some sort of potential cosmic picture, if you will, pointing from itself, not just a rattling bush. Um, and so it would seem that art actually has a lot to do because art and creativity is unique in this sort of creation of eyes, as opposed to just an association of a, of a shaking bus with a predator, right? And so when we talk about a meaning crisis, I think it's important to realize that we're not talking about the loss of the ability to tell that a shaking bus means that there's a predator. We're talking about the loss of the ability to have eyes by which to see things being part of something. And so this is what kind of happens. Creativity in of itself suggests that there's the possibility of working things into a framework, but if you don't believe in a creation or a creator, then you don't necessarily know if your creation is moving things into a framework or aligning things with a framework. And so the question is, can you believe just in the creative act that you are the framework in the creative act? And is that sustainable? Some people, maybe it is. Some people, it is not. The second option would be, well, what if there's like a creation like the universe that's not necessarily conscious, but there's some sort of cosmic order that is bigger than oneself, that is more complex than a mere reductionist materialistic picture, and that that is what one is creating toward? Is that going to be sufficient to have a sustainable identity? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe for some people, maybe not for other people. And then the next would be, well, what about belief in a creator? Kind of like universe plus consciousness, if you will, right? Or universe, like, because then you have to get like, what would be the difference between creation and creator, right? Is it the presence of some supernatural consciousness? Or is it suggested that there must be a supernatural consciousness in order for creativity to have um, this beneficial uh, function? Maybe for some people, maybe not for others. Um, it seems to depend. Something I will say is regardless what's of those three options that we are pointing to because of the beauty of lo-fi music, thank you, lo-fi music, uh, you know, there is, there's something about where I want to say, even if creativity 
is not in of itself sufficient. I, I have gradually over years been convinced it is necessary. There's something about it that is necessary, even if it is not sufficient. That seems to be what's kind of interesting to me, is even if we could say the creative act in of itself is not able to be its own grounding for whatever reason, maybe for some people or not, there is something about it that seems necessary in the way that it makes a person carrying the world. So maybe that's a, a point we can frame on the, 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 the sufficiency of it may be debatable, but maybe there's agreement on the necessity of it in, in someone's life. That would be something to consider. So on that distinction between creator and creation and creativity, um, like the, the question was raised, can we be towards creation, right? And I think that you can, but you get the myth of the, the eternal return, right? Because creation is, at, like, creation is pattern, right? And so if you, if you just worship creation, then you, like, you, get, you get nature worship. You know what I mean? You get pulled into, you live towards existing within the cycles of nature. Um, but in order to have a, a phallic vision, in order to have like a line through that circle to move history, in order to have history, you have to have some sort of creative, some sort of self or not, maybe not self overcome, but you have to have some, some means by which nature can overcome its current state, right? And you can't bring that back to nature because then it's just part of the state. And so if you are to, to suppose that creation could be other than it is, then you have to be towards the creator rather than creation itself. Um, and then, yeah, and, and uh, you know, I'm going to reiterate myself, but I think creativity, uh, you can't be towards creativity because creativity could be aimed in any number of directions. And so you're not really towards it, right? Creativity is, is the act of, of doing something towards your goal, but it can't really be the goal because it is the act of moving towards the goal. So, um, yeah, I would, I would agree with Daniel that, uh, we should worship the creator <laughs> if, that's, if that's what you're saying, but that's what I'm saying. Well, the, the question would be if, so there's a notion of creativity as either toward creation or toward creator, right? There is a note, a notion is posited that creativity needs to be toward some sort of mystery, either a mystery of creation or a mystery of creator. There is a notion that creativity to sustain itself must ascribe either to a creation that is integrated into its very essence, some kind of mystery, part of its very essence of what is creation, or it needs to be toward a creator that is in his or herself, you know, then we would go through the religious traditions potentially of that sort of mystery. Right. So what is this? Because this is interesting, because then this almost gets into practical questions. How does one practice in their daily life, organize events, create institutions, carry out families, et cetera, so forth? What is the nature of the practice when one is creating toward a creation of mystery versus someone of whom is practicing and in that practice in creating toward a creator of mystery. And by mystery, I'm using it as we've been using it in this conversation. What are the practical differences? You know, what is the nature of the organizations, the institutions? Are they different? Are they identical? You know, what, what happens in that unfolding? I mean, since we've gotten to this point, I really see this as like, um, like, yeah, about a relationship to nature. Um, like, is the world describable, like, or is there mystery, like, imminent in nature? You know, just how do you relate to it? And I think, like, I feel like the participatory music that um, musics one's life event forward past a, past a, um, like a, a milestone or a right in, in, a, in the unfolding of a person's life. Like the music does part of that bringing forward the life. I would, I, I guess like for me, like nature or the universe or what is as being worshipable isn't like at all, um, that's not a, 
an unreasonable proposition for my life. <laughs> um, and, but then, yeah. And it's not like I th would ever exclude there being something beyond that because I think I'm more in like a process metaphysics where of course itself is beyond itself. Um, yeah. But it, like, it, it's good because I felt like there was like a color of discord between our points. And then we like felt it out, you know, which was very like talking about like language and music as proto language. Like we could just hear it. Like there was just like a bit of a, like a, an off tone and we, we explored it. And then we're like, oh, okay. Like, yeah, we're holding different views and then together like built a picture of what those different views And that's really nice. <laughs> That is an example of a metamodern art form such as Zoom that is inviting people into a space to have an unfolding creativity into, uh, you know, what only can be realized in the tearing of the present uh, in different things. Um, I really appreciate the conversation getting here because what I, um, to me, this is where philosophy is approaching what I kind of call alterology which is alternative states of being. Um, and so you have theologies and alterology. You have um, alterologies that people are exploring and say technological singularity, because that will bring an alternative being. There's a notion of the universe being an emergent phenomenon process, um, you know, whitehead versus a different thing where it's kind of an alterology, where to me, what's very interesting, one of the reasons I really appreciate this conversation, because I think we all agree that there is something about creativity that is necessary. It may not be sufficient, but there's something about it that's necessary. And, and also, though, our definition of creativity cannot be restricted just to painting. You know, there are many ways that creativity is engaged, but there's something about the creative mode that seems very important for human, human flourishing, if you, if you give me that general phrase. The question, what's so interesting is it does seem as if creativity to really um, move beyond a self-relating negativity uh, which would lead to pathological effacement, then needs some sort of ascription to an alterology of some kind. Uh, rather, it'd be a mysterious universe. By mysterious, we're not meaning like fluffy mysterious, but more like a process, the process philosophy, uh, Flannery O'Connor's mystery, or a creator that also, you know, one of the problems I can have with the creator, of course, as I, you know, from all the religious work, I've done, is that the creator can actually become kind of a stagnant, solid thing that becomes an idol, right? You know, you can have problems in religions that, that do that. But assuming that we're not talking that, there's a notion of a creator alterology that is integrated with the mystery that seems to be, that seems to be very important. So what is interesting to explore, like the question that would be, would one would need to be, to ask is, is it possible to have a creativity that does not result in an effacement without any alterology at all? Is that an option or is some kind of alterology ultimately going to be necessary? Uh, this is something I ponder. Anyone has anything else to say, please. Well, first of all, just thank you so much for hosting this and you know, it's a, a real uh, treat and thank you, Sam, for uh, talking to me. And uh, I, don't know, I, 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 I hesitate to say anything here because like Sam, you're speaking to such a deep mystery, which is like the, the relationship between creation and creator. You know what I mean? It's like, how does that work? Right. And like, I, 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 I'm just going to leave, I'll just leave it as a question, you know, because this is like a, that would lead us into a whole other three hour discussion. But I think you're, I think you're exactly right. I think you're, you're on to the relevant question, right. Which is like, um, like is the is the capacity for overcoming the the patterns of nature is that itself a part of nature or is that something transcendent to nature um, and of course but then if you pros if you propose a transcendent you must somehow reconcile how that is imminent right like how like where is this transcend how is it acting within the world right um, and like the there's a Hebrew word the shechinah right which is like the present the dwelling place of God in the world. Um, all of these words are, are relevant and, uh, I'll, I'll leave that one for next time, but I just, I guess I just, I really appreciate the way that you took it there of like, well, is there, it's like, you're, you're saying we need something supernatural in order to, to aspire towards a change in nature, but like, why can't we just place that sort of mysterious, uh, transformative element within nature, right? And, and um, 
that's all I have to say. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure and I would love to do it again sometime. And thank you. Thank you for putting this on. And it was really nice to meet you, Zach. <laughs> Funny first conversation. Right, yeah, likewise. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed this conversation very much. I think um, I am very interested on the no uh, on the notion of a universe as this basis of alterology that is found in a process philosophy of a, of, of a whitehead. You know, this would be some of the thought that Mr. Bard or some of the some of the individuals in that corner explore. You know, I think Verveke will talk about religion that is not religion. Uh, there are these kind of possibilities of new sources of meaning that are a more um, complex understanding of the universe as a foundation for alterology than say just nature worshiping when I was uh, you know in Fern Gully or something like that even though Fern Gully was a great movie in 1994 when I was sick no one no one questions Fern Gully there 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 is something about a universe that is that structure that seems as if it's integrating with mystery and therefore has a unique foundational principle um, but then you know there's the question of you know, what is the judgment of the good? You know, if in, if, if in Christianity, you can say that it's the good to sacrifice yourself on a cross for other people. Like this is the standard of judgment by which one would occupy by. But then of course the problem is an institution can say you have to sacrifice yourself like Jesus for the church or whatever. And then you have control, right? You know, you have a group that's controlling. So it's very interesting to think about these, these different pluses and minuses of the alterology. But of course I am now, pointing to another three hours. So I appreciate this very much. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. I've, I've really appreciated it.